Hi, I'm Hari Srinivasan, an anchor and correspondent for different PBS programs like the News Hour and Amon Porn Company and Take On Fake, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. You know, in poker, it's it's pretty simple. You see what people do, and you bet they'll keep doing it. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with Michael Elkin. Hustling pool involved convincing people to continue doing something that was clearly not in their best interest. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that is very good training for psychotherapists. Mike was one of the first lead trainers in a model of psychotherapy and a spiritual development tool called IFS, or Internal Family Systems Therapy. Our mind is made of parts, and these parts are very much more distinct than you would think originally. IFS was developed by Richard Schwartz, who I interviewed in season one. I realized he was into something that was so far beyond what I was doing or anybody else I knew was doing, that literally I stopped doing what I was doing that day and started doing my understanding of IFS. Mike is a really interesting character whose self-admitted idiosyncrasies have especially earned him a reputation within the IFS community for his enthusiasm teaching about what we call firefighter parts of us. Those are the protective parts of your personality that typically show up as extreme beliefs or behaviors like addictions, compulsions, or suicidality. Our firefighters are the parts of us that most need to be good and therefore have the most extreme reaction to shame and the idea that they could be bad. We try to go easy on psychological jargon, but I think even if you don't know anything about IFS, you'll get a lot from this episode because most of us have been conditioned our whole life to have strong moral judgments, strong feelings against things like addictions and suicide, right? I mean, aren't those just categorically bad things that we have to fight against? This is really what's so mind-bending and revolutionary about the IFS model. Your willpower or your conscious decisions have very little to do with what you wind up actually doing. We talk about this state of mind that IFS calls self, but is really just all of our core spiritual qualities that all of us have been born with, which it turns out if you call upon it, and that's really what IFS teaches people to do, it has the power to heal and transform any parts of you that have become extreme or unhealthy or unbalanced. And I have to say, this is not what typical psychology or typical theology offers. You're driving along and some moron cuts you off and you're thinking about how you can improve his character and his driving. And and you notice it's also forming a hot knot in your stomach and this is not consistent with your well-being. You can put your attention on those angry parts and ask them if they'll give you a little space and just move back a little. And maybe they will. And if they do, your experience is you're not angry anymore. Now, the part's still angry. <laughs> but it's unblended, so you're not feeling it's feeling. Traditional psychological and religious teaching usually tells people to constrain their bad thoughts or behaviors. You know, manage your anger, fight your depression, overcome your addiction. But these management tactics require constant vigilance. And like a virus mutating in response to survival pressure, there's a hardening or resistance to change. Escalating schismogenic symmetry and what we call of uh, polarity, which are two parts with opposing solutions to a problem, scratching a mosquito bite. While you're doing it, you have some sense of relief, even though you know it's bad for you and it's going to make it worse. <laughs> Mike and I discuss how instead of fighting and resisting so-called bad parts of you, it's far more productive to become curious and explore the motivations behind the behavior or feelings that aren't acting in your best interest. And the minute you define somebody as a bad person or you define a part as a bad part, you essentially lose any ability to interact productively with that person or that part. I ask Mike to speak about Alcoholics Anonymous, which kind of seems at odds with the idea that we're all good at our core. I mean, it's a pretty strict program and there's a lot of pressure sometimes people feel to conform to the program. It's a very difficult program for somebody with an addictive thought process to use. But if they can, it works. Finally, we touch on how befriending the oftentimes scary parts that have suicidal or dangerous impulses inside of people or ourselves 
it gives you extraordinarily higher success in relief of those symptoms. What most consistently motivates human behavior is the need of our parts to feel like they're good people. We are good people. Welcome to The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is episode five of season three, Befriending Addiction and Suicide. I was mostly what they call a hatchet man, and I actually played my last basketball game with Dick, and I broke my ankle at that game. <laughs> I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Mike Elkin is an IFS senior lead trainer who has been involved with the model since 1995. He's been a popular presenter, conducting scores of trainings and workshops throughout the U.S. and Europe, and has taught several level one trainings in Boston every year since 2003. He was a pioneer in applying hypnotic and strategic approaches to addiction treatment and has integrated those tools into IFS treatment. He's the author of Families Under the Influence and several articles. Michael has a private practice in marriage, family, and individual psychotherapy, and he is very focused on training therapists in the internal family systems model of therapy, which is IFS and something we're going to talk quite a bit about today. Uh, Michael believes it's one of the most powerful, flexible, and humane tools for healing that's available. And he says it enables people to use their spiritual resources without getting into religion or metaphysics. Wonderful to speak with you again, Michael. How are you? I'm fine. It's a privilege being here. Thank, Thank you. Uh, it's likewise, it's good to see you. At, and, and, and tell people where you're at uh, physically, your, your location. Uh, I live in Marblehead, Massachusetts, which is a little finger of land that sticks out into the Atlantic, a little north of Boston. Yeah, great. And this time of year, you're you're appreciating that it's spring is uh, is actually true. It actually isn't here. It's, it's cold and rainy and miserable, and has been oh, for days. Sorry to hear that. Like, like, <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah. We in in DC, we get we get a real spring. Often, we get treated to uh, you know a, a big blast of summer right in the month of May. And actually, it's been quite cold here too. So. Um, you know, we're going to talk about IFS today. That's one of our favorite subjects. And, and you've, you, you've, you know, I, I've been going down this road that you've gone down. It's well paved by people like you in, in our field, people who have, um, you know, I've been doing IFS for my first training was maybe in uh, 2009. So big change for my career. And I think a lot of people that encounter IFS also have that sort of wow factor about how different it is, what a p different paradigm it is. And I know that you love to speak about that. So I'm curious, what kind of work were you doing before you learned IF, IFS? And, and maybe you can tell us about meeting Dick Schwartz. Okay, well, uh, before I met uh, Dick, I uh, was focused mostly around strategic and hypnotic therapy. And my major influence was Milton Erickson, Jay Haley, uh, Paul Vaclavic, those kind of people. And... Uh, I met Dick in 1984 at the presenter's party at the Family Therapy, it was called then, the Family Therapy Networker Conference in Washington. And uh, 
he uh, at this party, he made this sort of smart ass remark. And I was attracted to uh, kindred spirit and our relationship until 1995 mostly consisted of playing basketball and hanging out and doing social things. And I, I really didn't know what he was up to. When we talked about clinical stuff, it sounded like he was doing pretty much what I did, which was strategic hypnosis. Uh, I read his stuff, but I didn't read it carefully. And I was reading it through the eyes of a hypnotist. And so basically I didn't get it until in 1995, I went to an after meeting in Cambridge, Mass. And when I saw him do a demo, when he was talking about it, you know, I didn't get this self thing. When I saw he do a demo, I realized he was into something that was so far beyond what I was doing or anybody else I knew was doing that literally I stopped doing what I was doing that day and started doing my understanding of IFS. And just a couple of months later, I was able to get a training in Michigan where uh, I both learned how to do uh, IFS and I uh, learned a lot about cooking. There was a, a cooking teacher that came there and did a lovely job. And for a while, I think, and I've said this many times and nobody's contradicted me, I was the only IFS therapist east of uh, Chicago. And in 1997, uh, Ralph uh, Cohen, who was running the uh, marriage and family master's program at uh, Connecticut State, Central Connecticut State University, and he invited Dick to come and do a training, and Dick called me and asked if I'd help him, and that started my journey, and I did eight trainings in uh, Connecticut, is what we would now call a PA, which is I ran program assistant. And uh, the first Boston training, I think, was in 99. And I co-led that with Sue McConnell with Tony Herbine Blank as our assistant. And then I did three with Tony. Then I basically, I only teach level one with someone else because my style is idiosyncratic and some people have trouble imitating me. Sure. So I really like to have somebody with a very contrasting style to have people model after. What, what, what kind of what kind of basketball game did Schwartz have at the time back in the Well, 80s? Dick is actually a, a a pretty formidable basketball player, and Rich Simon, who was the editor, the later editor of uh, the Networker, was a really good basketball player. And I actually played Division three ball at Clark University. And I was mostly what they call a hatchet man, which is I got at the other team's high scorer. And I actually played my last basketball game with Dick. And I broke my ankle at that game oh, and geez. never played again. Oh, <laughs> that was, I don't remember what year that was, but it was before 95 when I uh, yeah. discovered IFS. And Jay Lappin, too, I think, was part of that. Yes, he games. was. <laughs> uh, shout out to Jay Lappin. And, and, and of course, our heart goes out still to the Simon family. I spoke with Zena Simon recently, uh -huh. uh, just in the last episode. She, she and I were scheduled to record uh, an episode together because she's a psychologist, as you know, yeah, know. In, in, in Brooklyn. And we were scheduled to record the week after Rich took his life. Yeah, and that was so just a horrible just, loss. And it, we're still getting over it. Yeah, Everyone's, no. Big I'm loss. working to get over it myself. Yeah, that itself will be a, a whole nother topic of conversation. Maybe I'll, I'm I'm thinking of having uh, David Kessler back on to to speak with him about it because um, it was it was it was. Well, I, I want to say I'm grateful to Cena for her willingness to talk about it and to talk about suicide because that's something that, and and we're going to talk about suicide today in general yeah. because we're going to talk about how IFS has really a mind bending approach to to. Things like suicide, in fact, um, and 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 addictions, and, and things like anger. Um, let's back up a little bit. We're going to get to that. We'll, we'll get to okay. firefighters and suicide and all these things. But um, for people who are listening who may not know, they just know maybe a little bit about IFS because maybe they've heard me talk about it over and over. Um, let's just give a basic rundown, Mike, if if we can, a short overview. How do you how do you give the uh, the, the rundown of IFS, what, how would you describe it to somebody? Well, yeah, it's a multiplicity model, which means 
our mind is made of parts, and these parts are very much more distinct than you would think originally. And you know, part of you wants to do, part of you wants to eat the chocolate cake, and part of you wants to uh, have the uh, lose weight. And how much energy each of these parts have uh, will uh, determine what you wind up doing. And uh, your willpower or your conscious decisions have very little to do with what you wind up actually doing. Uh, so, uh, and that's not an uncommon uh way of thinking like multiplicity has been around you know in various forms for a very long time uh what distinguishes ifs in my understanding is what dick discovered well, he made a number of very important discoveries the main discovery is that uh parts can what he calls and this is jargon blend and unblend uh, and they do that usually quite ecologically and naturally. You know, you go to work and the uh, therapist part of you blends with you and you are that part. It's like a hat. It's a role that we we play. You think it's thoughts and feel it's feelings. That's what blending means, that a part has become you. And, uh, and then uh, you get a phone call from uh, the school and you're... you're parent part blends and you say well where's the therapist part right now and it might be off there still thinking about a client but the parent part has so much more energy that you're not aware of the therapist part's thoughts and feelings you're you're thinking the parent part's thoughts and feeling the parent part's feelings what Dick discovered is that you can ask a part that's blended to unblend, which is if you type that on your computer, you will the spell check will show up and tell you that's not a word, <laughs> but it is. <laughs> and we <laughs> use it all the time. Uh, and uh, you can ask a part to basically change its relationship with you so you're not change, thinking of thoughts and feeling its feelings anymore. And... Uh, <clears throat> Like you're driving along and some moron cuts you off and you're thinking about how you can improve his character and his driving. And and you notice it's also forming a hot knot in your stomach and this is not consistent with your well-being. You can put your attention on those angry parts and ask them if they'll give you a little space and just move back a little. And maybe they will. And if they do, your experience is you're not angry anymore. Now, the part's still angry. <laughs> But it's unblended, so you're not feeling its feelings, thinking its own. Mm. So Dick mm. discovered that. And then when you were talking to parts that were causing trouble, he was working then with bulimia a lot. And so we'd ask somebody if they'd want to talk to their bulimic part, and she'd say, sure. And they'd be, and so the bulimic part might separate and they have a sense of that part, that part being separate from your awareness. And he would say, he would notice that. This person would then excoriate <laughs> the uh, uh, bulimic part, and he would say, uh, "You know, can you just could you be a little less angry? Could you ask that angry part if it'll just relax a little?" And it did. And then, uh, so he would start keep asking parts that were not having a good effect on this bulimic part because nobody likes talking to somebody who doesn't like you and thinks you're destructive. Right. Uh, right. And what he discovered as he did that, people became more homogenous and people uh, and the parts became more cooperative. Yeah. And at some point he asked somebody, you know, well, what part are you in now? And she said, no, this is not a part. This is just myself. Hmm. which turned out to be a very happy <laughs> uh, label. And because it, uh, it doesn't generate a lot of religious or metaphysical thought. And he discovered we all have this spiritual resource that experiences only compassion and curiosity hmm. and uh, has... Met other qualities that he later start with C, 
uh, which is really good if you're writing a book. And uh, <laughs> compassion, curiosity, courage, calmness, courage, connectedness, clarity, uh, creativity. Uh, anyway, uh, and Mike, all of those, all of those attributes that you described as the self, you said that's really what happens. That's the core of us. Psychology would call that executive function, but it's more than that, right? Much, it is much more than that. It is really a spiritual state because it's, it's and without really calling it a spiritual state, it's a spiritual state because it, it sort of can go any direction. It's more like our being. Yeah. And it's not, it is not uh, defined by our identity. In other words, you have self and I have self. And it isn't like it's Keith's self and Mike's self. We both have, mm-hmm. it's in uh, a quality of our existence. It's an attribute yeah. of our being. And it really, so this IFS is the first model of psychotherapy that actively uh, utilizes our spiritual resources. And we, and, and it can be used with, you know, uh, aggressive atheists and uh, fundamentalists. Right. Uh, although right. you know it's tricky to work with extreme uh, beliefs, uh, you know, experienced therapists yeah. can do that. And right. I've, I've actually successfully used IFS with both aggressive atheists and ex- <laughs> fundamentalists. Uh, a, although that, I have parts that get triggered by fundamentalism because I think I'm fund. I have fundamentalist parts that are attached to IFS. So <laughs> exactly. That's a really good point, which I, which we'll uh, you know, talk about sort of in, later in our conversation here that, that I, I have those same questions I wonder about, our attachment to IFS, right? Um, and how that shows up in our work and how that polarizes with people who are not, you know, doing IFS or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, you, you talked about how different the IFS was and yet, how it was using aspects of things that had been around, lying in the in the in the shed, right? For for the therapist, we had Gestalt, which is you know you get people talking to themselves, you get them role playing, and hey, tell that tell that schizophrenic part of you to shut up, right? And that's what Gestalt would <laughs> sort of do, a little bit of cognitive behavioral. Um, let's override these parts. Let's let's overcome them. Let's get let's get them to 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 go away. And and he so he he blended. Um, using blending in another in another way here, he he incorporated um, systems thinking, and also uh, what's the word mindfulness? But um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inquisitive inquiry, mm. right? Sort of I can show up and like if I say to you, Mike, hey Mike, how are you? And I'm I'm meeting you for the first time. Hey, that's a stupid sweatshirt you're wearing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like if I show up and I greet you with this animosity, there's going to be but like you said, resistance, right? Why not show up when we show up to these parts? Why not greet them and and find out what they're doing? Hey, hey, Mike, how are you? Where'd you come from? <laughs> Tell me about yourself, right? right? Where did you buy that sweatshirt? <laughs> Where did you get that sweatshirt? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you've been doing this a long time, and and in our in our work, we talk about and I appreciate that you said jargon and lingo because we we have it, we get it, and it, sometimes it can be a burden also for people. Um, we'll try to unburden that if we can today for people and try to explain these things. But you know, we talk about managers, the three aspects of the psyche as it, as we are getting to know our parts. We usually get become aware that there's there's patterns, right? There's a you know we're discovering new parts all the time, perhaps. I just developed a new part the other day that, or found a new part that was having a reaction to all these cicadas that we're having outside. Oh yeah, we missed. I've never actually seen them. <laughs> I've always been too far north. <laughs> well, it was like pure curiosity. All my biology parts were like, "This is like amazing. It's a big science experiment." And now, like, <laughs> by the time you're like unsticking the gooey guts of them off your shoe. Right. For the- <laughs> totally disgusted. So we're finding new parts all the time, but they generally coalesce into three categories, the managers, firefighters being the protectors. And and I'll ask you to talk about how we define those. And then also, what are they protecting? The exiles. Well, the topology Um, actually uh, is, uh, it's not just that all our parts are managers, firefighters, or exiles. Those are uh, terms that that are given to parts that have been forced into extreme roles. 
Say more about that. Well, the thing is that in IFS, we have one diagnosis. You know, there's a DSM and it's this thick and it's a, a book full of unsolvable problems, basically. Uh, <clears throat> and in IFS, we have one diagnosis. You know, there are no borderlines. There's no depressive. There's a, there's no depressive disorder. There are no disorders. Mm -hmm. The only diagnosis is parts that have been forced into an extreme role. And extreme is defined as uh, not consistent with somebody's best understanding of their uh, best interests. Mm. Uh, parts that eat destructively or get into, get, get into fights and rages or uh, want to hurt us or other people or kill us or other people or uh, yeah. no matter how extreme or drink too much or uh, whatever. And the uh, and what we want to do when we find parts that are forced into extreme roles is make friends with those parts and find out what they're up to and, and how they learn to believe that what uh, they're doing is in the best interest of the person they're part of. Yeah. And the assumption is, uh, which is very different from the assumption of almost every other uh, approach to healing, is that these parts are doing their very best to, do, to be of use to the person they're part of. <clears throat> they're actually trying to be helpful. Yes. And what forces them into extreme roles, what makes parts act in extreme ways, uh, is that they're carrying burdens. And what burdens are, is it, they are the meaning that this part has given certain experiences they've had and the feelings and beliefs that proceed from those meanings. Okay. Like, if I do this and you t give that the meaning that I think you're stupid, uh, um, then and you're crossing your, your arms for people who are not able to see this. Oh, you're yeah, right. Your I, arms, I'm right, sorry. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Talk that. <laughs> <laughs> I do this in person and, it, you know, I think, yeah. So I had this sort of stern look on my face. And if you were a child of mine, you would think, well, uh, I disapprove of what you are doing and possibly what you are. And if I'm a, 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 a parent or an authority, you might take that to mean uh, you're bad and stupid. <laughs> and uh, that's a burden. Mm -hmm. and, and from then on, that part will see the world through the lens of that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we can't help but give meaning to our experience. We're meaning-making animals. That's what right. we do. Anything right. that happens, our parts give it meaning. And different of our parts uh, give different meanings. You know, that same stern look, another part might just give it the meaning that I'm a jerk. <laughs> right, right. Uh, or another part may have no idea how to understand what I did and just be confused. Yep. So, uh so this understanding of burden, so as you get to know a part that's not functioning consistently with your well-being, you get curious about how it learned to see the world that way. And it sounds like, Mike, you're um, putting a little less emphasis on it than, than a lot of times we, we have to when we're teaching this or learning it. Um, Thinking about managers, firefighters, and exiles, those three right. categories. Yeah, well, these are categories. And, and the thing is that what happens is when we have some disconnecting experience, some sh shaming experience, because my understanding, and this is the thing that I'm working hardest to teach, I believe that what most consistently motivates human behavior is the need of our parts to feel like they're good people. We are good people. We are. Now, of course, a good people means very different things in different contexts. You know, what a good Nazi is and what a good Quaker is uh, would differ radically. But both of those people uh, are doing their best to perceive themselves as good and make sure other people perceive them as good. 
And, uh, <clears throat> and what our systems are trying to do is to avoid the most painful thing that can happen to us, which is we experience shame. And shame is the experience of having our badness witnessed. And it's excruciating. And it, uh, it takes us out of contact. The minute you experience me as having witnessed your badness, you'll discover your body will avoid contact with me and compress. And uh, <clears throat> maybe even try to get rid of you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Shame Attack. is what generates violence. Yes. Uh, and let's, let's go back to what you said, because I think it was so radical. I think we have to just like underline this. Okay. And, and like, so there's such a thing as being a good Nazi, right? And you're saying, you're saying in the context of, look, we've got to look and we've got to stop using these categories to show up and challenge people's parts. Because if we just you, because you know everything inside of us may say, "Wait a minute, Mike, what did you just say about there could be a good Nazi, right?" So, there, <laughs> right. So help me walk me through that. Well, the thing this is, is, if is radical, and you know, if you were in Germany in 1940, uh, you would be doing your best to be a good Nazi because the people who were not perceived as good Nazis seem to disappear at a very high rate, and. Uh, <clears throat> And calling somebody a Jew in that context would be uh, shaming uh, right. and would be, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, they, the Nazis did succeed in making a lot of Jews be very ashamed of being Jews and doing their best to not be perceived as Jews or, or in fact, less than enthusiastic, active Nazis. So. Uh, there's pressure, enormous pressure to conform. There is in, in any in any society, and and so when we experience the, ourselves as being perceived and witnessed as being bad, uh, we experience excruciating pain, and we do our very best to uh, to relieve that pain and. When and a firefighter, you know, managers are the parts of us that try to suppress the, the bad parts, mm -hmm. the parts that aren't functioning consistently uh, with our per our perception of good goodness. Right, and that's parts, and, and, and just to go backwards for a minute, that was that's what got triggered for me when I was thinking, well, how are my, how are the our listeners going to hear this, Mike? Um, my manager part just kicked in and said, Mike, you better explain this comment about Nazis. <laughs> right, because right? it was afraid that you you would be perceived as having somebody on a Nazi on your show. You got it. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and, and th what would that would be either mean you had terrible judgment or yeah. you had very questionable values and you're a, a bad person. And, uh, that's that's my manager part at work there doing its right. job to keep me uh, out of trouble. Right, and if in fact, you know, you have parts that are uh, very sensitive to the understanding that uh, you know the perception that you have bad judgment, and they get energized, then parts of you uh, would react and try to put out that fire and stop that and right. and say something to me like what do you mean how could you be you know and get angry yeah. at me right i'm gonna and push back we all know what great results we get from getting angry at people but <laughs> but the part of you that knows that getting angry at me probably would not be consistent with good radio uh <laughs> would not be available to you that's right because that firefighter would have much more energy yeah than that part of you and uh, and would you know roll over your managers who are saying, wait a minute, no, this is big, you know, and right. that's how we live our life. That's what we do. <laughs> right, right. So, if the manager's uh, not doing the job, yeah, the firefighter kicks yeah, because, in because because there you might have had a part that uh, was criticized for bad judgment or made a mistake. God help us, made a mistake and was shamed for that mistake 
And then our managers uh, found a way to get that part. We don't know how they do this, but we know that they do it. To get that part, what we call exiled, to make it unavailable to your awareness. The shame. Yeah, the part that was shamed. That yeah. would be the part that I would trigger by talking about good Nazis. Exactly. And what would then that part would trigger your angry part that uh and so on. That's how yeah, yeah. That's how it works. Right. So those right. are all extreme parts. The part of you that sent me the email to get me on the show and whatnot is none of those things. It's a part that's running a radio show. Right. <laughs> right. right. And and our, our parts have agendas. That's how we can tell that they are parts that as as differentiated from self, which tends yeah. to not not have an agenda and tends to just be curious and compassionate and all of those things. Yeah. And if we if we extend um, curiosity, compassion, courage, you know, these qualities of, of self towards the parts, they begin to change. They begin to transform, right? Even, even extreme firefighter parts or extreme manager parts like Nazis or, um, a part that might be a Nazi, all of that, a part that wants to kill somebody, a part that wants to, um, do, do, you know, destroy things. Right. A, a part that projects its feelings of inadequacy and, and, and unsureness on other people right. and then wants to destroy that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and just a footnote here, it doesn't mean sometimes we don't have to stand up to parts that are doing damage in the, in the world. We have to stand up and, and be, you know, be wise and as well as compassionate. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how transformative it is. How did it change your practice, Mike, when you were, I've had, I've had a therapist say, you know, I've had a 40 year career. And the day I started using IFS, and I think this is similar to what you, you've talked about. That was the day that they no longer needed to hospitalize people for suicidal risk. And I've had a similar experience as a, as a social, trained as a social worker doing community mental health, lots of, uh, dual diagnosis work. And then, um, learning IFS realizing that you don't have to confront these parts. Why is it so radically different? Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. Well, yeah, the thing is, first of all, uh, confrontation, although it gets a good press in many ways, uh, you know, basically means saying to somebody, um, you're bad. Uh, and getting into, you know, and you know, you're wrong, I'm right. <laughs> and getting into fights with people. And, uh, you know, I studied martial arts for many years thinking that would make me safer. <laughs> and it turns out that I've never won a fight or ever talked to anybody who has won a fight. Mm. Uh, so uh, given the fact that you can't win a fight, IFS basically gave me a model of a paradigm of thinking, which allowed me to stay out of fights. Now, I've learned how to just get curious about that part and find out uh, how it grew to believe this. You know, a, a question that I ask an awful lot is, uh, you know, how to ask the part how it got that idea. Ask the part how it learned that. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Not, you see, because, you know, not where did you get, so where did you get that idea? But so where did you get that idea? How did you learn that? Just curiosity. Yeah, cu curiosity. And uh, parts and people like to talk about themselves when they think there is an audience that's interested to listen. And so what I'm trying to do is help my client get their protective parts back so that they can interview their own parts with curiosity and compassion and learn about how they got there. Right. And the other, one of the other breakthroughs Dick made was that he discovered that self has the ability when asked to remove burdens from parts. So that say, 
uh, somebody was sexually abused as a child and they have parts that think that means something about their worth as a human being, their ability to connect to others, their ability to have relationships, the role of sexuality in their lives. Uh, <clears throat> and it turns out, of course, that's simply not true. <laughs> It means nothing about those things. And if the part that is carrying the, the beliefs and feelings from the sexual abuse uh, is interviewed by self and feels really understood by self and seen by self, uh, and they ask to have the burdens that they acquired, the meaning that they gave these experiences removed, they're gone. Uh, it's, it seems too good to be true, but it's not. And, uh, you know, I experience it pretty much every day. And, uh, and then the person will remember all these experiences they've had, but they will also live in a world where these mean nothing about them. And the symptoms that were developed to sort of cope with the shame and pain of this experience disappear and uh you know they can talk about these experiences without a lot of affect yeah uh it's you can see the transformation you can you can go back and test it how do you feel in this situation and what's coming up for you when this happens and you, right. know, you actually see some some change yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it because being in the presence of self-energy is the opposite of shame you know it's it's having your badness, uh, the, the 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 things that you think made you bad, experience with love and understanding. Yeah. Uh, and and being in when a part is in the presence of self, whether it's witnessed or unburdened, it still transforms. And some parts transform seemingly almost completely, and some parts transform a little bit. But they all, you can't be in the presence of self and remain the same. Right. It's essentially a mystical experience being in the presence of self. It's, it's, it's a pathway. It's a pathway, right? It's, it it is a, it's a systematic. I've I've often said Dick has found this way to systematize mindfulness, which is also a pathway to spirituality um, and apply it in these very, um, unique situations, not just like zoning out or zenning out, but actually interacting in the real world and changing uh, behavior, changing actions, changing thought potential or fl- thought fl- flexibility. Um, Mike, can, can, we, can we talk shop a little bit about what you just said, the, the act of a person tapping into their self can be unburdening for parts and relieve pain or relieve the pain that parts are carrying. Yeah. Is there, you're, you're a You've studied hypnotist and you've pra- practiced hypnosis. Is there is there any difference, perhaps, uh, in in hypnosis? Is it really just like a hypnotic suggestion that that IFS is is doing to say you've got this self, you've got this pure energy, just just open up to it. Go ahead. Well, I mean, the thing is that that uh, when I did hypnosis and taught hypnosis, it turned out I really didn't understand what it was. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, uh, and when I was a hypnotist, I thought it was my job to outsmart the crazy parts of my clients, uh-huh. and that that was that was a very difficult job. And and it also, I had parts that thought, <clears throat> to the extent I could accomplish this, I was a good, competent person, and to the extent I could not, I was not a good, competent person. So when I was talking to people. Although I was not aware of it consciously, I always had a dog in the fight. Yeah, you had an agenda. My worth as a being was on the line when I was trying to help other people. Yeah. And with IFS, my job, as I understand it, is to broker a relationship between this resource that everybody has uh, that has essentially infinite capacity for healing. And the parts of the client that aren't functioning in their best interest. Yeah. And that takes a lot of pressure off me and allows me to be much more comfortable and secure while I'm working, Mm -hmm. which allows my comfortable, my client to be much more comfortable and secure in my presence. And if I see a client begin to get uncomfortable, 
rather than think, what's wrong with them? My my instinct now is to look and say, what am, what's going on with me? Mm-hmm. What am I generating that's making the, my client's protective parts activated? Right. And, you know, I may notice some part of me that is trying to get something done or has some kind of agenda that is making my client's parts uncomfortable. And if I ask that part to unblend, my client gets more comfortable. Right. Uh, and so another thing it does is allow uh, therapists to be human beings and to have parts and limitations and not have to get defensive about it. Uh, right. or pretend to be uh, more together than their clients are. Yeah. Because one teacher of mine who was a spiritual teacher, didn't know IFS, but uh, said, therapists are people who need 30 hours of therapy a week, and that's why we do this. <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, and every when therapists hear that, they laugh, but they know it's true. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a dagger right in the heart, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dagger. No, it's that, you, know, I, I, you know, people say, "How could he act like so crazy?" He's a psychologist. I say, "Well, <laughs> duh." <laughs> Person right. who needed thirty Never hours of therapy. Insurance, he wouldn't. Yeah. You know. yeah. What's the journey you've been on with your own parts, Mike? As far as um, like you, you mentioned, uh, you know, that your your parts were getting in the way at first. Um, and I know you, you've taught about this, especially when you teach about firefighters. One of the one of the most compelling thing I think when people mention firefighters, your name gets mentioned. Mike Elkin, <laughs> talk talk to Mike, talk to Mike. He, you know, and, and there's something about your passion for loving firefighters. I think that connects to a lot of people. I got into this business originally because in the '60s, if you had been a drug addict, you were automatically qualified to be a psychotherapist. <laughs> right. Uh, and right. I had been a jazz musician, and uh, you know, back in the day, if you were, jazz, you know, you uh, it was you, I, I became an opiate enthusiast. Yes, and uh, and it turned out it didn't work out well for me. And yeah. uh, you know, what I did with it essentially was I became addicted to martial arts, which made me uh, actually more dangerous. <laughs> But uh, look better from the outside, and uh, and so I, you know, I basically spent. I, I I I'm not good at time, but it was between say twelve and fifteen years, working pretty much exclusively with people who were uh, chronically addicted, and they they were colonized by addicted parts, and. Uh, so did not behave well. And I spent a lot of time talking to uh, perpetrators, people who had been by, because I was a big guy with a violent, you know, martial arts background, who are you going to refer them to? <laughs> uh, and I talked to a lot of people who had sexually abused their kids and, and beaten their partners and, uh, and found that uh, confronting these people and getting in arguments with them was really unproductive and no fun. And mm. and because I had made when I was you know out there as they say in the church basements, uh I made my living because you know I wasn't making a whole lot of money as a jazz musician. Uh Hard to hustling believe. pool and hustling poker. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that those that is very good training for psychotherapists. Uh, because, you know, in poker, it's, it's pretty simple to win in person. You know, there's an algorithms now, which I don't understand. I don't, but, uh, in those days I said, how do you win at poker? You see what people do and you bet they'll keep doing it. And, uh, hustling pool involved convincing people to continue doing something that was clearly not in their best interest. Uh, and so it was, it was an easy transformation to strategic psychotherapy. Hmm. Uh, and Jay Haley's book, Strategies of Psychotherapy, changed my life and made me think of myself not so much as a two-bit hustler, which I was, but as a strategic psychotherapist. And I began hmm. to take myself much more seriously. And, uh, and also Jay Haley was a bridge to Milton Erickson because he was Erickson's Boswell. 
And uh, so then that led me to my study of hypnosis. But uh, I spent a lot of time talking to people who uh, basically were dominated by addictive parts and learning about addictive parts. And, you know, I wrote a book about how, you know, somebody who is uh, dominated by addictive parts in a family, how the family has to reorganize around them and how to throw a monkey wrench into the thing so it doesn't function smoothly anymore and people become motivated to do something different. Uh, that was back in 84 that came out. And, and Mike, how did you see the 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 role of groups like AA? You mentioned the church basements, right? Which is, you know, AA is has been the big book. Bill Wilson has been a huge influence for people because, it, you know, it really did give structure to, to kicking out the, these colonies of addictive parts. Yeah. But what's the, but, you know, what, what have you, what's your experience with that? Well, the thing is that I was quite amazed that it worked for a lot of people. And I, it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into a, I have a bunch of anecdotes about that, which I'm going to skip. But, sure. but basically, uh, it made a breakthrough, which it, you know, uh, addiction was considered a character disorder, which means a moral impediment. And the thing about defining something as a moral problem is that there is no case on record where a moral problem has been solved. Moral <laughs> problems are unsolvable. You can't turn a bad person into a good person. And the minute you define somebody as a bad person or you define a part as a bad part, you essentially lose any ability to interact productively with that person or that part. So, uh, so addiction was an insolvable problem. And what Bill Wilson said is, uh, you're not bad, you're sick. And you can't help it. And you're not making a decision to do bad things. You don't have a power to make decisions about this. And, and recognizing that and asking your managers, he didn't use the term, <laughs> to essentially surrender and say, okay, I don't know how to do this. I need help. I need help, which, you know, I have a whole thing about addiction being best understood as a religion rather than as a disease. But I need help and asking a higher power we call it self, <laughs> but they call it higher power, to heal us, to find a way to take this off us. Uh, and for a lot of people, it, it's a very difficult program for somebody with an addictive uh, thought process to use. But if they can, uh, it works. There's a lot of structure and a lot of pressure to conform in that, in yeah. that group, which is and, maybe and, why it works. But. A, and in an AA meeting, being a good person is a very different thing than out there. If you go to an AA meeting, uh, you know, if you go to a cocktail party and you meet somebody, they're going to tell you about their successes and the fact that they just got promoted for what this and this big deal they did and blah, 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 and they were on TV. If you go to an AA meeting, they talk about the terrible relationship they're having with their daughter and trying to think and how they uh, they talk about their vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. They talk about uh, their bad parts, their exiles. Yeah. yeah. It's a way different <laughs> experience. And th that culture encourages that. Right. Uh, and they have a process, you know, they have the fourth and fifth step, which is taking a fearless inventory, essentially, of the bad things you've done and sharing that with another person and being, which is undoing the shame. Yeah. And yeah. the other person is saying, yeah, 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 I get it. You know, yeah. and the other person you you have a sense has done a lot of the same things, <laughs> and has been through this process themselves, and so there is there are parallels between twelve step and uh, IFS. IFS is much more efficient because uh, it's really helping people uh, get a very 
direct sense of of theirs of who they really are. Yeah. And the yeah. fact that in fact they're not really bad after all. Right. You, and, you don't have to get rid of the, all the bad parts. You can actually get just get to know them. Yeah, it's a little lighter. Because what firefighters are, are they are the parts of us because irony, a friend of mine said, and I'm so sorry he said it before I thought of it, irony is the driving force of the universe. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the, our firefighters are the parts of us that most need to be good and are therefore have uh, the most extreme reaction to shame and the idea that they could be bad. And when they have that feeling, it's so excruciating to them, they need relief. And they find something that seems to give them relief, and they get very attached to it. Yeah, because it works. It gives that quick relief. Well, it does the way scratching a mosquito bite works, uh, which is while you're doing it, you have some sense of relief, even though you know it's bad for you and it's going to make it worse. <laughs> and uh, And you get that kind of relief. And the problem is, of course, the mosquito bite gets worse. And that generates shame. And then you need more relief. Yeah. And then whatever you get to more relief generates more shame. And then you need right. more relief. And you get right. what in power theory they call escalating schismogenic uh, symmetry and what we call uh, polarity, which are two parts with opposing solutions to a problem that the activity of each of them escalates and stimulates the other one. like a, right. a, Arshendo. Yeah, you know, an arms race. Yeah, like two armies yeah, fighting. Yeah. You know, you know, so I get a club and you get a bigger club and then I get a knife and you get a spear and then I get, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and it's it's it, it gets very uh tragic and destructive and and sad. And and so you're saying it really doesn't relieve the firefighters don't really end up relieving any pain they think they are. No, they they don't, and they get it gets worse. And you know, worse. and and what you said, Taylor, the firefighter is I know, you know, is is what what we need to feel safe. The thing that is most dangerous to us when we say, "Is this a safe place or not?" Uh, is safe from what? And it turns out it's safe from moral judgment. Mm -hmm. And what you say to a firefighter is, "I know you're not bad. I know you can't help this." Yeah. No, you're doing your best. Yeah. Because we don't form moral judgments on what people do. We form moral judgments on why we think they did them. And so if you're extending acceptance and 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 belonging to that firefighter, which actually is fighting to belong. Yes. You're speaking its language. Right. <laughs> and, and it starts to relax. And what if we could go to the part that you experience as so bad and shaming and healed that part so it didn't feel bad to you anymore and it didn't didn't make you feel so uncomfortable so you don't need that relief mm -hmm. how would that be and so you didn't experience it as bad anymore you see we're not asking you to stop scratching we want to help you stop itching yeah and and so let's say the firefighter says yeah great nice it sounds great mike because you're 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 doing this step I wanted to talk to you about. I mean, you're, it, you know, it's a, it's a step. And like you, we talked about twelve steps, but IFS has lots of steps as well yeah. um, of being the hope merchant. Uh. And uh, and so you're you're saying, hey, what if this could work? I think it can work. I, well, why don't you just try it? Let's see. Right. You don't have to believe me, but if you could just get back and be a little curious, let's see what happens. Yeah. And I might say, as the firefighters say, oh, yeah, it's, I feel relieved. I feel great, but. I just don't think it's possible, man. Yeah, and, and you don't have to think it's possible. Just would you be willing to consider being a little curious about it? And that's what you say to suicidal parts, too. Is Because suicidal, you know, there are, there are two kinds of suicidal parts. There are relievers. You know, I can get you out of, the, you know, this is a get-out-of-jail card. I, I can relieve this pain if it gets... Or punishers, uh, this scum has to be wiped off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And and both of them, you can say you, that there's this person, you know, I can, you know, we can stop this pain without you having to kill this person's body. 
Mm. You know, I know you're trying to help. Both of them experience themselves as trying to either relieve excruciating pain or to uh, basically help this person not have to be a destructive scourge of the earth. And in both cases, we the hope merchant says, we can solve your problem without you having to sacrifice your life to save this person. And then what's and next, it Mike? Because it's it's so it's such a mind bending moment. That moment when you when you say when you make the offer to the firefighter, you first of all make the connection. You say, "I'm not going to try to get rid of you. I think you belong here." You make the connection. The firefighter relaxes. Like I feel myself as I'm imagining a, a, you know, in, myself in the role of a firefighter. You know, pushing, trying to get something done, trying to get relief. I relax, but then I and then you say, "Well, you think you can do it differently." And I wonder, well, how? How are you going to do that? So what's the next step? Well, introduce me to the part of you, the part of this person, yeah. uh, that's causing you all this, this discomfort. So we and have to go to us, that? Watch us heal it. Really? So, so in other words, you're asking me to expose something I don't think we should ever expose. Right. And yeah, it's going to be okay? But, but, yeah, but I'm not asking. The person's self is asking. Yeah. This, this this mind of compassion and, con, uh, you know, it's not like, trust yeah. me, you know. It's, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, it, that's uh, what I was wondering. Self-energy yeah. <laughs> self has to be present for that to happen. Yeah, you. Na- I think you nailed it, yeah. Get self-energy available. That's all I do. Yes. Once I get self-energy available, then then these parts will be able to accept it. Now I'm looking at my watch and realizing yeah. I have a client in like four okay. minutes. Or so. All right, we'll wrap it up. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll end on this note, Mike. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I think I think you really nailed it with that last point, Mike. The, just the, the idea that we, we we really can't get blended with an agenda to try to get rid of a right. part. Like we really have to genuinely sit yeah, and be patient. The thing is that that one of the things that we have no ability to get rid of parts. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. I have no interest in getting rid of them. But if I had an interest in getting rid of them, uh, all your parts are going to be your parts for the duration. Yeah, and it, it, transforming parts—that's what we do. We don't get rid of parts. Yeah, we don't get rid of parts. Michael well, Elkin. I wish we had more time, but we don't because I really love talking to you, kid. Yeah, thank you very much. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or or hear more, get access to courses, and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show. And subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrop. All right, I will go.